The Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We're joined by Chris Ellis from Feathercoin. Megan Hello. Lord from Bitcoin, not bombs. Hello. And Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Hey, how's it going? Issue one. World Crypto, oh, what's it called? 2014 Bitcoin Costume Contest. Mad Bitcoins and his merry crew of superheroes took care of business this weekend at the San Jose Big Wow Comic Fest. They set up a costume contest using only paper wallets with the prize money crowdfunded by the Bitcoin community. So far, more than half of Bitcoin has been donated, but the contest is not over yet. Awards will be given out tomorrow morning right here on this very channel, the World Crypto Network, 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. It was supposed to be announced on this show, but we changed it. We bumped it. We moved it. We gave them the old, what's that called again? The old switcheroo. The old switcheroo. So vote for your favorites while there's still time. Bitcoin costume contest. Great contest or the greatest contest? Who's your favorite and why? Chris Ellis. I think The Alien is my favorite. I'm a huge fan of that franchise, or at least the first three anyway, uh, before you know it got butchered. But um, yeah, I really want to know a little bit more about this. So you, you just did this spontaneously? You just went out there? And yep. no plan? Uh, we were talking about it during the World Crypto Network meeting, and we were just uh, brainstorming what kind of ideas, what we could do for a show. And uh, Jerrica, who plays uh, Black Widow in the costume contest, uh, she's an avid cosplayer, been doing this for a while, and she was coming down to San Jose, and I'm close enough to San Jose to make it happen, so we pulled it off. And people that you signed up, they weren't into Bitcoin already, right? Like, you're, you're, you're actually getting them on board. Most of them have no idea what Bitcoin is at all. I remember we were telling a Superman, and he just seemed like we were talking about some alien stuff. He just had these bright blue eyes, and he had no idea what we were talking about. But I was very serious with each one of them when I gave them the envelope. I was like, this is like cash. If you lose this envelope, you mm. lose your prize. Like, there's no other copy of this key. It's inside right. of here. So that was the most serious part. Key? You're going to send them over to blockchain.info? Yep. They've got paper wallets, instructions to go to blockchain to set up an account. And then a little bit of instruction if they want to go to gift or somewhere to cash it into a gift card and then they could buy something they want at Amazon or Target or anywhere. And, and I expect them to spend it uh, if they learn how to use it. Uh, it's possible they could save some too. But the real advantage here is that these cosplayers, especially the uh, professional ones who rent booths and sell photos of themselves at these conventions, they travel around the country and they have a need for Bitcoin. They use uh, Square, they use that credit card thing on top of your iPhone. Uh, they could use Bitcoin just as easily. And this gives 15 of them a chance to get into Bitcoin. Oh, that's very good. I really applaud that. Well done. Megan Lords. So I think this is a great culture to overlap with, with Bitcoin. Like you said, these people are traveling to conferences all around the country. They're using Square. Uh, you know, maybe even some of them are agorists, and they don't even realize it yet. And I think Bitcoin would be great for them. And I think my favorite costume, I'm going to have to get to say the alien, too, it, because it looks like a real alien. I mean, the details on that costume are crazy. Like, you can't even tell. I mean, obviously, it's a person there, but you can't even tell it's a person in there. And it's just so crazy and yeah, they got they definitely nailed that one. Christoph Atlas. I think my favorite was the uh, the Benjamin Losky outfit, which is I think right now it's ranked at number two. I like that uh, you know regulator and executioner. I am kind of futuristic. The law. Yeah, yeah, I love it. It's um, I think they really captured the spirit of uh, New York's uh, top financial regulator. Very good. Exit question: Who wins? Final answer, one word, Chris Ellis. The alien is going to win it easily. Megan Lords. Alien. Christoph Atlas. Um, mad Bitcoins in a surprise upset victory. Mad <laughs> Bitcoins in a surprise upset. Of course, the smart money is going with the alien, but there's always a chance for Metroid here. Samus Arun could have a comeback. Moving on to issue number two, Bitcoin Pizza Day. Another year, 
another pizza. Now the Bitcoin pizzas originally traded two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins or 5,000 Bitcoins of pizza are worth more than five million dollars. And so we Bitcoiners celebrate Bitcoin Pizza Day. Bitcoin Pizza Day, the latest in internet fad holidays like May the 4th, Talk Like a Pirate Day, Yuri's Night, or Christmas may have real staying powers. It offers a chance for Bitcoiners to both atone for their sins of not buying and holding Bitcoin earlier, as well as the opportunity to enjoy some great pizza. What did you do to celebrate Bitcoin Pizza Day? Do you think this new holiday will catch on? Megan Lords. So I really hope this new holiday catches on. Unfortunately, I'm not supposed to eat pizza because I have a gluten intolerance. So um, I do love gluten-free pizza, though. So I didn't get to celebrate with one, unfortunately. But uh, I was there in spirit. So uh, I do think yeah, it's important it's... To, to have an open holiday where you can make your own pizza or pizza-like alternative. So it doesn't have to be the, the bread and the dough. So. Right, right. Christoph Atlas. So today, I guess that those Bitcoins be, would be worth five or ten million dollars, but here's another way to look at it. Um, 10,000 Bitcoins is a certain percentage of all the Bitcoins that will ever be in existence. There's going to be 21 million roughly in existence in the future. So based on the current estimates that are put out by the Fed, which are probably vastly understated, uh, that would be equivalent to around 609 million dollars. If for a pizza, if you uh, took a, the same percentage of the total uh, currency stock for the U.S. dollar. So I think that's fun to think about that, you know, even as, as uh, ridiculous as that seems right now, it's just going to get more ridiculous in the future. And for $609 million, you'd think they'd throw in some crazy bread, too. Maybe a little soda. Chris Ellis. I totally missed this. I didn't know. Um, and actually, people, um, Peer Bell, particularly on, on Twitter, was like sending me pizza, you know, with change tip. And I was like, oh, cool. Maybe I'm just like a cool dude and people just like me. And then I, <laughs> then I found out that there was like pizza there. I was like, oh, the shame, the shame. And um, so I did miss it. But I, I definitely think we should do more of this. And I, I would also like to see each country's cuisine represented it, because, we, you know, this is a global currency. I think, um, you know, not that I'm biased, but Britain should go next. So, you know, fish and chips, uh, scones and tea. We talked about this earlier. You can't get scones in America, I hear. Is that right? Maybe Unbelievable. Maybe a fancy hotel or something, but yeah. not so I, think, I think we should do, like, each country should have a day where we go out and we buy that food, you know, that country's main dish, like its flagship dish with Bitcoin. I like the idea of uh, Bitcoin being a coin of restaurants. That Bitcoin is a coin for people that go out to eat. We can go out to eat together as a group. We can do it on a schedule. And then maybe that can be just a thing to reward restaurants of a certain genre that take Bitcoin. So, Megan Lords, what's on your pizza? So I would have a gluten-free crust uh, with red sauce, uh, artichoke hearts, definitely, some uncured pepperoni, uh, onions, red peppers, jalapenos, um, and cream cheese, and yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. Excellent. Christoph Atlas, same question. Well, I'm actually a, a level five vegan, so I don't eat anything that casts a shadow, but I do like this idea that somewhere out there, there's some pizza guy that has 10,000 Bitcoins. A little while ago, I, there was this short story that was posted on Reddit and it was talking about, it was like the, the distant future where someone came back from the future. They're like, I want to warn you about the future of Bitcoin. And, and in this, this uh, dystopian future, all of the wealthy Bitcoin owners had, uh, they had privatized everything and just gone mad. And they had established what they called Bitcoin citadels, where they just own vast swaths of land with elaborate buildings and whatnot. And I like to think that one day there's some random pizza dude that just... You know, it's going to be one of those Citadel owners, and perhaps they'll get to work as his butler. <laughs> Very good. Chris Ellis. Uh, what's my pizza? Probably American hot, I think. <laughs> Just keeping it simple. Very good. Moving on, issue three. Defiant Brock Pierce will not step down. More drama from the Bitcoin Foundation. 
In attempting to fill the empty seats of under-investigation CEO of BitInstant Charlie Shrem and Mark Carpellis, CEO of the bankrupt Mt. Gox, the Bitcoin Foundation was looking for a quiet, respectable, run-of-the-mill candidate, and that's what they got in Brock Pierce. The former Mighty Duck star has been accused of some pretty nasty things in his previous dealings, and many members of the Bitcoin Foundation have begun resigning in protest. Pierce, however, plans to stay on. The Bitcoin Foundation, Great Foundation, or the Greatest Foundation? Christoph Atlas. Hmm. I don't know what to think about this. I mean, uh, I, I tend to think that... I, I've been asking this question for months now. What, what does the Bitcoin Foundation do that needs to exist? Why, why would anyone give them money? Why would people not be demanding refunds for the money that they've given them in the past? Like, What are they doing? I know that there are some people that are working for the foundation, uh, like our colleague Will, who, as far as I know, he works for, for free. I don't think he gets paid for what he does on the Bitcoin found Education uh, Committee. So, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily need to happen in relation to the, the Bitcoin Foundation. So I'm really not clear on what it is that they do that it that is useful. Um, I've, it just, it's, it's interesting to me that I've, no one has been able to answer that question for me. You know, there's paying the developers, right? But you can just, I mean, there are lots of platforms out there for paying developers through bounties and so forth. Um, and apparently they're burning through something like $150,000 per month uh, doing who knows what. I suspect that a lot of that goes into efforts like lobbying and so forth, which again, my problem with, with these political lobbying efforts has always been there's no way to measure the efficacy of those actions. So you can't go back to the people who gave you their precious Bitcoins to the to this foundation early on, who many of whom I'm sure would wish that they could have them back now, and say to them, look, this is what we've accomplished. This is the change that we've made in the world based on your very generous funding of our efforts, your very generous funding of our, our comfortable lifestyles, and, you know, as far as their lifestyles go, it's interesting to... I'm sure it would be fascinating to compare the income of the average Bitcoin Foundation uh, paid employee as opposed to the people working on the Dark Wallet project, who got a tidy sum overall for a crowdfunded uh, software effort. But, you know, if you look at, at, at uh, Amir, he's like you know, living in, in communes and... <laughs> Voluntarily. People's... What's that? Voluntarily, though. He's doing that. Oh, yeah, of he? course. No, but Ben, I think part of the, the reason why he does that is because he can work on uh, projects that people care deeply about, but that people don't necessarily can't... They can't fund it with deep pro, deep, deep pockets. You know what I mean? So he's, work on, he's able to work on things that are more meaningful to him and more meaningful to the people around him. And it looks... It makes it... It makes the the Bitcoin Foundation look by comparison like an organization that's established primarily to uh, promote the interests of the large corporate corporations and stakeholders that are funding the Bitcoin Foundation. It makes it look like they're a group of political entrepreneurs that are trying to get on the right side of deals uh, to, to further their wealth uh, beyond what they already have. So I would really love to see something from the Foundation showing us look, this is what we're doing. No one else could have done this better if they were uh, given the same opportunities. And that's what I think we are owed by the Bitcoin Foundation. Chris Ellis. Yeah, I kind of echo a lot of that sentiment, really. I, I, I do know why they exist, though. It's, it's because the, you know a group of people want to get together and agree on a sequence of activities in the future that benefit them. Um, the problem is that the Bitcoin community is such a small, uh, the Bitcoin community is such a small one that everyone's kind of looked to them for representation. The people that don't have strong objections to them kind of think that they should be representing everyone. And when I was at the conference, the question came up is that, you know, why doesn't the foundation represent other blockchains, other altcoins? And Gavin Andreessen sort of stepped up quite quickly to say, well, there's nothing in our articles that say we can't. Um, it's just that they, the other coins seem to set up their own sort of foundations. And I would say my experience in the UK, we've got uh, Paul Gordon here and Ian Cresswell and people like that 
who set up the UK DCA, the UK Digital Currency Association. And we ended up, you know, getting the VAT, the sales tax taken off of Bitcoin through, you know, just getting together and saying, well, who do you know and who do you know? And comparing our contact lists and just kind of, you know, educating the government about it. And, you know, Feathercoin, the same with, with Hull. Hell City and getting in there. It's just a case of um, educating people because you've got to remember that governments are people too. So I wouldn't say that it's so much about um, you know there being one foundation. I think that these foundations are absolutely necessary, but they're necessary to a locality. So I don't think that we should just leave it with the Bitcoin Foundation. I think we should all go set up our foundations. And if you can better, you know, give a better value proposition than they can, which it looks like you know it wouldn't be too hard of an effort to to undertake, then I think you should absolutely go ahead and do that. So Chris, would you just say that they're basically a cartel at this point? No, um, I wouldn't say that because when I met them, they kind of came across as decent people. Like I, I was open-minded. I went in like, yeah, okay, mostly critical. Um, but then when I actually got to see, you know, John face to face and shook his hand and stuff, um, I was like, okay, you know, these seem like well-meaning people. They answered the questions really, really well when people were criticizing them. And they were quite self-effacing and quite sort of humble, I think. Um, Vicente said that he only gave them the C- minus for their efforts. And, and I do think that, that the bounty system doesn't really work. Um, and this was brought up... Um, by Mike Hearn in his presentation how the, the reward system at the moment is is not really working and so he's got his lighthouse project which is like a distributed Kickstarter so that you can raise money I think that's a great effort and obviously we do you know no open source project is really free because the developer just ends up ch passing the cost on to their employer or in some other area so I do think that we need to take a long hard look at this as for the actual question was about Brock Pierce and when I sort of looked into this, I couldn't find that he'd actually been charged. There was stuff being thrown around on the forums and just sort of ch chitter chatter and just rumours about a settlement. And I think people saw the word settlement and jumped to the conclusion that he'd paid off the prosecutor and got off. And I don't think that's very fair. When I saw him um, giving talks and stuff, it sounds like he's got an awful lot of experience in this industry. It kind of makes me feel like actually the whole foundation comes across as the kind of people that want power and are good at keeping it once they have it. That kind of worries me a, a little bit, that, that he sounded like he was already very good at doing deals and, and making money. I'm interested in a foundation that helps the little guy because I think that's what Bitcoin can have the most impact for. It has the most impact for the people that are weakest and, and need that representation. So I, I, I haven't decided. I haven't made up my mind. I'm definitely going to listen to them. If they ask me for help, I'm not going to say no right off the bat. I will definitely give it consideration. But yeah, um, I have my reservations. Megan Lord. So this is something I have to do more research on. And it's something that is a, a familiar question I've heard to you, like, what does the foundation do? I'd like to see results. I'd like to see what they're engaged in, where all of these Bitcoins are going. If they're going towards lobbying, obviously that's not something I support. Uh, as far as the Brock Pierce thing, I don't um, know the details of what he's done or why, he, you know, why people have uh, such a negative reaction towards him, but I do think if you're going to claim to represent the members of the foundation, that their concerns should be taken into account. Um, obviously, it sounds like he's very good at what he's doing, but do we need more people lobbying for politicians, or do we need more people helping, you know, the rest of the world. I mean, I, I could say for sure that Sean's outpost hasn't gotten nearly the amount of Bitcoin that the foundation has. They were able to feed 60,000 people in a year. Or not 60,000 people, but, but deliver 60,000 meals to the homeless in a year. I mean, when we start seeing results like that from the foundation, maybe I'll start considering them more. But I know for a fact that, I mean, they don't even cover some of their members to, when they get invited to speak at conferences, stuff like that. And it's like they have all of these coins. What are they doing with them? I'd like to see some evidence of where they're going. Uh, and just a, a little more transparency because I feel like you kind of get these non-answers uh, when these questions are asked of them and they're, they're, it's something, it, the whole thing seems really shadowy and it misses the whole point of Bitcoin being a decentralized system. Why do we need a foundation? Why, why do we need this or organization that claims that they represent a lot of Bitcoiners? Obviously they don't. So I, I, I'm a results-oriented person. That's what I'm going to need to see. Uh, I don't really have a strong opinion, I guess, against Bitcoin Foundation. I'm just skeptical of what their role should be. And uh, I, I 
wouldn't say I have a positive opinion of them either. I, I just need to see what they're doing. Uh, if they're supposedly doing education, that's great, but I, what are you doing for education? I mean, are you printing guides that are getting people started on Bitcoin? Are you setting up meetups uh, to engage local communities? Like, where is that money going for education? So I, I need to see the documents is, is basically uh, my position on the foundation. At the very least, Bitcoiners want a free lunch from their foundation. Exit question. Did you know the Bitcoin group has its own website? Yes, it's true. The Bitcoin group on the World Wide Web. Can you imagine that? The Bitcoin group .com. Subscribe. The Bitcoin group is also part of the World Crypto Network. The World Crypto Network is the only place in the world to get daily YouTube shows about Bitcoin. New shows every day at worldcryptonetwork.com. Subscribe on YouTube. Quite a lot of plugs, huh? They say we do that to pay the bills, to keep the lights on. Yes, yes. Moving on. Issue four. Choose your own topic. Falcon Global Capital has just registered to become the first official lobbyist to lobby Congress in favor of Bitcoin, while MasterCard has signed up to lobby against. Self-proclaimed Bitcoin hater Peter Schiff is now selling gold for Bitcoins through his company, Euro Pacific Precious Metals. I guess if you can't beat him, join him. And Charlie Shrem is finally free. That's not the right headline. Oh, whatever. Charlie Shrem is finally free. Well, he's not free, but he's free from house arrest. He can leave his home, so he's probably playing Xbox. But anyway, which story most interests you? Chris Ellis. Well, after all that fuss that Peter Schiff put up, for all that time we had those debates, we have one on Let's Talk Bitcoin, ran this like long thing, like just a whole series of him not getting it very, very publicly. I just felt like screaming at him, like, dude, we all had this when we first learned about it, okay? Just go away in private and have these reservations. But he just seemed to just repeatedly not get it, and now it turns out that he's like, oh, I can make money out of this thing and it's so cheap to implement. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I just kind of think, oh, for such a smart guy, I'm really quite disappointed. Unless there's something about this story that I'm not seeing. The beautiful just, part just... from the article is that he's claiming to still hate Bitcoins, but yeah. his company is now accepting them for gold. So basically he's become a hypocrite. He's doing yeah. one thing and saying another. That, I'm, that is quite staggering, and he doesn't think that any of these digital currencies are going to survive long term. Actually, I don't entirely disagree with that one. I mean, most of them probably won't. Um, we should say something about Dogecoin a little bit, shouldn't we? Uh, um, Christoph, like, tell, tell us about your, your animated GIF. You oh, yeah. Um, I don't have it pulled up at the moment, but um, do, you, do you have well, any just, it, Thomas? Uh, about Dogecoin? I was looking for it on, uh, on Reddit, but I couldn't. Find it again. And I just like to draw the audience's attention to that wonderful painting in Christoph's background of like the Dogecoin. He the missed the flight to the moon. He he missed the flight <laughs> to the moon actually. Yeah, this maybe is, next time. The very unfortunate turn oh, oh, oh. Dogecoin prices. If you look back a little bit, maybe you can zoom out a little more. But uh, we're also talking about uh, Peter Schiff, Megan Lords. What do you think? Or Christoph, you want to go? Well, I was just going to say, there's a lesson to be learned there about altcoins. You know, like, altcoins, the vast majority of them, um, you know, a lot of them are just, just nothing happens with them right there. That They're not that useful. Some of them will spike up in price, and then they will go back down. And that certainly has happened with Dogecoin in the past. It may happen again. We don't know. Uh, don't... You know, don't bet the farm on the long-term growth of Dogecoin or Darkcoin or any of these other coins. Uh, keep in mind that the the network effect of Bitcoin is is massive, and they're all competing with that massive network effect of Bitcoin. Even Bitcoin itself is not a sure thing. But so I think I would just encourage people like if you're going to if you're going to play the speculator in this market, then you shouldn't feel upset if the coins end up um, going down in price. I don't even want to say failing, but going down in price because that's what you signed up for. Megan, Lord, which story would you pick? 
So I want to say I'm very happy to hear that our benevolent overlords have given Charlie Trump a little bit more freedom. I think that's really great news. Um, but I want to comment on the Peter Schiff uh, discussion. That is really, oh man, this guy is great. Uh, so he obviously sees the the value in Bitcoin, but not because he understands it, and he's still a very proudly a Bitcoin hater. But something else people might want to consider: the market's really slow right now. I work at Roberts and Roberts, which is a precious metals brokerage. Probably does similar things to uh, what Euro Pacific does, and we've been taking Bitcoin for a really long time now, several months. We were one of the first precious metal stealers to start taking Bitcoin. So. What I would recommend, if, if people are interested in converting their Bitcoin into precious metals, because a lot of people, a common argument that a lot of us hear all the time is, oh, what is Bitcoin worth? It's not worth anything. It has no intrinsic value. Whatever. For people who think gold has intrinsic value or you know, silver has, has this value, they can convert that over. I wouldn't suggest using Shift, though. Obviously, he's not a team player with this. When it comes to where I want to spend my Bitcoin, I want someone who's engaged in it, who's very very, uh, you know, concerned with the direction of Bitcoin and who has a, you know, good understanding of it. So that's where I would choose to spend my Bitcoin. Um, and he doesn't, this is about making money. Uh, markets are slow. I, I would say uh, that's true for a lot of the places, at least here in town, uh, you know, that we associate with. And I think it's probably on a larger scale too. I think business has kind of slowed down for precious metals and this is a way that he thinks can probably invigorate his uh, business but doesn't really, and I, I would think that an answer, if you, if you were to come and say, you know, you obviously still hate Bitcoin, why are you even taking it? It would probably be, be dismissed with, well, I don't really handle that department of Euro-Pacific, you know, it's just kind of whatever, and it, it, it is easy, it shows how easy it is to implement and all that, but he's not in it because he believes in Bitcoin. I, I mean, it's, it's such a joke, like P Peter Schiff was, he embarrassed himself really, really badly uh, in his misunderstanding of Bitcoin. I mean, it, it was really pitiful, and for him to come back and, you know, be like, oh, no, I'm going to take Bitcoin now. It's, it's not because he believes in it. Obviously, he's probably just trying to make some quick money, um, or he views it as maybe a way that he can stay relevant. Um, <laughs> so he's very, he's very good at picking up on cultural memes and kind of staying relevant. Uh, so I think that's really what this is about. And if you are interested in supporting precious metals industries that are into Bitcoin for the right reasons, who uh, you know are really passionate about the future of it, there are a lot of those out there, and I can definitely help you out with that at Roberts and Roberts. Uh, so just a plug for where I work. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Peter Schiff is he's desperately trying to stay relevant, and I feel bad for him. Well, and remember, they're most likely converting their Bitcoins immediately into cash. They're not going to be holding Bitcoin long term. And he's probably just using Bitcoin as a transfer mechanism, which, of course, Bitcoin works totally fine with because Bitcoin's an international currency. It's incredibly useful. Try selling little shavings of gold through the mail. Try putting gold into your webcam. Good luck with that. Moving on to questions and answers. Our first question is for Mr. Chris Ellis. Is Chris still thinking about doing a regular show, or is he burnt out? Mr. Chris, the people want more. I know, I know. I'm doing um, a Q&A, like a sort of a, a panel discussion with Counterparty Mastercoin on the 5th of June in London. So if you're a member of the London Bitcoin Meetup group, you should definitely come along to that. Um, I am working on it. I'm, I, I'm a little bit burnt out because I kind of really kind of threw myself in last year. And so I have kind of been trying to take it easy, but I've also been brainstorming and meeting people and coming up with ideas because I don't just want to do yet another, you know, the same old format as everyone else. So thank you very much for the interest. Watch this space. I'm going to continue to do the meetup scene. I'm going to continue to do talks. I've got another talk coming up, but I can't, doesn't come to me yet. But I, I do have more things. So yes, watch this space. Very good. Going back to Christoph, did you have a comment on the last story? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, you know, with, with Peter Schiff, of course, like in his mind, this is just him converting people's useless bitcoins into to precious, precious metals, right? So um, I don't think it necessarily makes him, him a hypocrite. He, his his uh, criticisms uh, of bitcoin have been a, 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 as a currency, not a payment network. Um, I don't think he understands how the payment 
network value gives it value as a currency, but that's neither here nor there. Um, regarding the Falcon Capital uh, people that are lobbying politicians on behalf of Bitcoin. I had a bit of an interaction with them on Twitter before the show, and I'm looking forward to talking with them some more about this, but really I think the efficacy of what they're doing depends on their goals, right? And whether they whether they share my goals with Bitcoin, are they looking for Bitcoin to simply be a PayPal 2.0 platform where regulators will put in you know, guardrails in place and set the standards for what businesses can and cannot do with this new technology. In that case, then maybe their lobbying efforts are perfectly reasonable. Maybe this, this will ingratiate them with the right people and they'll be in place to make some money off of PayPal 2.0. If they share my goals, which go far, far beyond that, then I don't think that... I think it's it's kind of silly to think that we're in a position to educate regulators, right? These are not, they're not, I mean, a lot of them seem very ditzy, right? But by and large, the people actually making decisions, uh, the people that are, you know, the majority whips and the minority whips and and the the people that are really backing the the decisions that are befallen on, on the rest of us, they don't need education. They understand what the score is. The score is that Bitcoin and the Federal Reserve is a zero-sum game. There's no win-win situation for those two entities. And so the idea that somehow you're going to educate them into the glory and the, the, the mystery of, of Bitcoin payments, and they're going to be scanning in QR codes and be like, ooh, yes, I love uh, that was really fun. Uh, let's, let's give Bitcoin a chance. They, they don't, that's not going to happen. They want Bitcoin to die. They want it to turn into an incremental tiny improvement over the status quo and maintain their positions of power. And I don't want that to happen. Can I add on to what Kristoff was saying about uh, these regulators? Yeah, lobbying with these people, it's it's... Uh, just such an incestuous system to begin with. But these people have no incentive to understand Bitcoin. They have a very big incentive to throw a lot of us in cages, though, because that allows them to retain power. And it makes them, uh, you know, it makes their position as a regulator have meaning. Uh, so I think that's something to consider. I, I don't want to be involved in any kind of lobbying uh, with the government. And it, obviously, it didn't work out well for Charlie Shrem. He was a person that tried to team up with them. He was the person that pitched this bit licensing idea in New York, and he's the person that's walking around with a damn bracelet around his ankle and is allow only allowed to go out of his house after months of being stuck there. Between the hours of 9 a.m., 9 p.m., he has to submit proof of employment to his uh, jailers, and uh, you know he's in a terrible situation as a result of going with the flow. And for completely nonviolent alleged offenses. I mean, this is what they can do to you. Even if you harm no one, uh, yeah, you basically become a real slave with something on your leg tracking your every move. I mean, we know that they're already spying on us and, and all of that, but I mean, that's a whole different level of imprisonment. I think of it more of watching than spying. They're just watching. Moving on, bonus story. Ripple... Price of Ripple plummets as co-founder plans 9 billion Ripple sell-off. I was sent a link to a forum the other day about an angry, upset Ripple developer who was done with the company and deciding to sell his 9 billion Ripple. What happened to Ripple? Could this happen to other cryptocurrencies? What will happen to Ripple in the future? Any ideas or thoughts about this late-breaking story? Chris Ellis. Why don't we tie this in with another question that came up in the Q&A uh, from Infinite Radio where he says, can someone explain ways in which markets can be manipulated on exchanges uh, like Cripsy and MinPal? And the thing is that when you start a currency, you're incredibly privileged because you knew about the idea before everyone else did, or at least most people did. So you can get in early. You know what your plans are. You know your level of energy and your level of competence. And so you know what can be done. And so, yeah, you, ha you see this all the time. Um, people, we, we did that show, what was that one, the Panda Coin, right? And you were reading that out, Tom, in that like Homeric tone. And, 
and the thing is, the way, what happens is the worst enemy of a project is actually comes from inside of it. It's one of the co-founders actually who uses their influence on the market as a, a lever against other people if they don't get their ideas heard or if they don't get their projects put forward. And so then they kind of go on the forum and like, right, that's it, I'm done, I'm dumping all my coins and then they're going to go march off to the thing and then everyone watches it and it crashes. And I've seen this happen on altcoins before. And it's really just a, a sign of weakness. And, and really, the, the, the people need to question their integrity in the first place. A lot of people come to me recently saying, like, oh, what's happened with um, Feathercoin? I was like, what do you mean what's happened with Feathercoin? It's still working. Um, but we never cared about the price. We never messed around with people's expectations. We didn't paint pictures of fucking dogs in, like, space outfits you know, doing cartoons, going to the moon, but then at the same time, like giving people Dogecoin and saying, it's not about the price, you know, spend it on someone else, it's all about giving and tipping, which was something that they just stole from the Feathercoin forum early on, they, they saw that I put this thing up and I said, oh, it's all about the tipping culture, and so they, they kind of, there's this kind of cognitive dissonance between our, our need and our understanding for more generosity in the world, but then not actually being able to live up to that when the rubber hits the road and it's up to me to actually start giving and then I end up going on the exchange. The Cripsy and all of those things are massively manipulated because it doesn't take very much money to paint pictures on the charts, right? And and you, you know, you go on there, you've got five hundred dollars, you can start painting a picture on one of those charts. And then what you do is you set up a bunch of shill accounts, like bogus accounts in the chat room. And the people that go on that chat room are really vulnerable, right? Because they're approaching a decision. They want to turn X amount into more money. And what you do is you say, oh, something I've heard, I've got a rumor that something's going to go up in price. And then you put in a little buy, right? And you make the price go up on that coin. And everyone looks at it going, oh, yeah, it's a green candle. And it's like, yeah, I think it's going to go up. And then you put another buy in, right? And the candle goes up a bit more. And they're like, OK, this is going up. And so everyone rushes in because they don't want to miss out. Now, if you get that little feeling, if you're on an exchange, Acknowledge the fact that you're in a vulnerable situation. Acknowledge the fact that there are people there that don't have your best interests at heart. These are not financial advisors, okay? They're there to make money out of you. And if you start to feel like, I might miss out on this, then you know that that's not the right thing to do. That's the best signal that your mind and body can give you that that is a bad trade to make. A good trade is one that falls into your lap, right? You see it and you're like, oh my God, this is an absolute shoo-in. And Dogecoin was that that trade, right, early on when all the people were saying, oh, it's just a marketing scam. I was like, no, no, I mean, this, this, is, this is interesting, right? It's a fluffy, cuddly brand, which most industries have, and it's a very popular internet meme. And I, I do, on the whole, I think it's had a net positive effect just because of all the new people that have learned about crypto. But there was something slightly disingenuous. I don't mean to speak in the past tense. I'm sure it will carry on. But there was something slightly disingenuous about on the one hand it all about being the tipping but then you had this kind of moon motif that for me just completely undermined it then it was like okay but you clearly just want to buy it to sell it for more later on and all this tipping isn't really genuine I mean imagine if someone you know gave you some food or, or did something kind for you and then actually turn around and tried to claim some prize for it it's like you'd just be, you'd be offended, you'd be shocked and mortified if somebody uh, like done you a favor but then you'd later found out that they really did it for their own self-interest. That just, yeah, so that's the, that's the struggle this whole industry has got to come to terms with. I don't know if I am sold by that, if, if it really is a genuine conflict of interest there. Like to me, I mean, Doge goes up, let's say, and you make some money off of it, that gives you more wealth to send to other people. And, you know, like, you, you can... But a lot <laughs> of this... you give away all of your... Yeah, give away all of your goes, you don't have Sorry, any goes left. What is that what happens then? So what, pe people only want to make money so they can be even more generous? Is that we do know that in the Bitcoin economy, at least, that people... There's more donations the higher that the price is. There's more purchases mm. the higher the price is. So there, there is a, been a a wealth effect established in Bitcoin. I don't know if that's true for Doge necessarily. I haven't done the economic Remember, analysis. But one of the Doge there. things was that you can give someone a thousand Doge instead of giving them like a 0 0.001 of a bit. And it was this idea of this false inflation where a thousand Doge sounds like big money, right? A thousand dollars is good money, you know, 10,000, but really a thousand Doge is like 50 cents. Like, you're not really tipping a lot of money. It's this false 
tipping of like, oh, I'm a millionaire in Doge. Yeah, you have four hundred dollars. You know, it's not that great. But go ahead, Christoph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, that, I think that's the end of the point that I wanted to make. All right, Megan, anything to say about Dogecoin or Ripple manipulation? I don't have any comments on that. It's something I have to look more into. Very good. And we're running out of questions, so we're going to move on to predictions or story of the week. Chris Ellis, are you ready with a prediction or a story of the week? Yeah, I am, actually. I, I said it on Twitter the other day, but I'll elaborate more. I think this cryptocurrency proliferation won't stop until every single word in the dictionary has the word coin after it. And I think we will continue to treat these altcoins like a slot machine but we won't tell each other that and we won't accept to each other that we're really just stealing from one another because it's a massively zero-sum game and that whole kind of dark coin thing that only happened because the dark coin project was confused with a dark wallet project and so people started putting money into it because of all the hype but then that kind of carried its own sort of narcissistic kind of rally right and carried on its own momentum and it gets to the point where you, you're just, it's just a mugs game. By the time you've heard about it, it's already too late, right? If you're hearing about it on the chat room, it's it, you, you've missed your opportunity to buy it, right? If you're looking at lots and lots of green candles, now is not the time to buy. Of all of these altcoins, and I say this as someone who's you know been a co-founder of 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 a coin uh, of Feathercoin, um, the fact is that Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency to have survived in in the long run in terms of price, right? All of the other coins have taken massive, massive hits. And whenever Bitcoin goes up, the altcoins go down. I think that's what's about to happen. I think we're about to see another rally, another another quite sort of long bull run from Bitcoin. I won't make a price prediction. And when it does, I think what you're going to see, just like you did back in November, you're going to see all the other altcoins go down because it's, it's Bitcoin that most people really, really believe in. Megan Lords. So I just wanted to say I have a couple interesting interviews coming up that viewers might be interested in. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I'll be interviewing Leif and Lamar from FIVA. I don't know if you guys have heard of the FIVA wallet. It's uh, the wallet for iPhone. They were able to use some creative uh, ways to get around the ban on Bitcoin wallets. So I'm going to be talking with them about that, about that. I met these guys in Texas, and they're just really, really interesting to talk to. They have a lot of really cool stuff to say about building and communities too, which is another thing we're really going to be focusing on, is this idea of uh, what's called potluck capitalism. So definitely check that out. And then uh, next Wednesday, um, kind of later at night, probably around like uh, 9 o'clock uh, central time, I'm going to be talking with Will Pangman, who's usually on the Bitcoin group. Uh, we're going to be talking about some projects that he's involved in. So uh, yeah, just check those out. What was the name of that wallet that works on iOS? How do you spell it? It's uh, FIVA. P-H-E-E-V-A. Yeah, I never would have guessed that. Christoph, Atlas. I want to finish up with some thoughts about um, altcoins, altcoin markets, and what, what Chris was talking about. Um, I'm not sure that the dark coin price was so much to do with mistaking dark coin with dark wallet. Actually, in many ways, dark coin is a little bit ahead of the game in terms of their anonymity technologies, in comparison to the dark wallet folks, um, they've been, uh, in some respects, they 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 have made more progress than the than dark wallet. But um, and and a lot of the price increase in dark coin, I've been following it closely in my show uh, the last several last couple months really, and a lot of the price has closely tracked with particular technical changes in the code base. So like the first run up in Darkcoin coincided when uh, they released their dark send technology from the from the test net to the main net. So in other words, when people were actually to able to use Darkcoin in a more anonymous fashion than they were previously able to use it, the price went up. And I think that's a that's a positive indicator. That tells me that people are actually actually doing some fundamental analysis of the value of this currency. Now that being said, Chris makes an excellent excellent point, which is the market caps of these currencies are tiny compared to many other assets right there. So, and, and in fact, you know, there's not a lot of like uh, checking into your identity or anything like that when you're, when you're trading these coins. So there's not much mechanism in place to stop people from manipulating the markets. And we also have 
a group of people out there that are very gullible in terms of, um, you know, what's the next new hot coin? Ooh, you know, what is the troll box saying now? Like, it blows my mind that people would ever use this as a, a means of figuring out what to invest their, their wealth in, but people do, and they do. And I think this is going to continue for a while longer. I think it will die off for the more veteran people because eventually they will figure out, like, okay, a lot of this is just pump and dump. I am being used to make bitcoins for other people that are repeating the same damn scheme over and over again. They make some small, incremental, meaningless change to their cryptocurrencies. And, uh, oh, it's a, new, it's a new mining algorithm. So if you switch to mining our algorithm, you'll be on the bottom floor. You know, like, and that hasn't been done literally 200 times by now. Um, so a lot of the veterans will drop out of this altcoin market and they'll, they'll stick around in Bitcoin. But the other thing that's going on is we're getting more new and new, you know, new people into the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space all the time. Part of the success of Bitcoin is to bring new people into the cryptocurrency space. And a lot of those people will be like, damn, I really wish I got into Bitcoin when it was a few cents. I'd be a millionaire, billionaire now. Uh, oh, there's all these other cryptocurrencies. Well, maybe I can make it, maybe it can happen there. So it's going to happen for the next several magnitudes of change in the Bitcoin price. So we're going to have suckers coming into the altcoin space to fuel these pump and dumps for uh, a long while to come. And um, I would just sort of uh, condition people that, look, um, there are no guarantees in this market. I'm glad that people who have been following me have been able to make some significant coin off of a dark coin. I think that's wonderful. Is it a good time to get into it right now? I don't know. There will be some, uh, some more strong developments in dark coin over the next uh, month or two. They're, they're continuing to develop their anonymity technology and uh, innovate in that realm. And I think they're doing a really, I mean, it's really one main developer, Evan Duffield, who's just, I don't, I don't know how he, he has some kind of like time machine technology to get 48 hours out of the day or something like that. He's just, he's a one man uh, power. And, um, but he's doing wonderful things. He's continuing to develop this technology. So if, if speculation, speculation continues to follow the fundamental changes to dark coin, it will continue to go up. If this is all just a, you know, a speculative bubble, a, uh, a mirage cast um, by the, the people that are, are manipulating the price, which absolutely can happen because this is a small market, um, then it won't continue to go up. It will go down from here, and now is the time to sell, which is, which is the case. I have no idea. I don't think any of us do except for those few people that are uh, you know, actively manipulating these markets. So buyer beware. Very good, and my prediction, even though Chris has already poo-pooed it, my prediction is that dark coin will pass Litecoin in price. No way. I can't predict that. That already happened. There's only one serious coin with a greater value than dark coin. And that coin is Bitcoin. Does dark coins gastronomic capacity know no satiety? We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye.